people. Thank you. That was exciting. Throughout this week, we've been uh, talking about the American dream and all that it signifies for people of all ages and nationalities. This morning, Counselor to the President Kellyanne Conway and Advisor to the President Ivanka Trump hosted a listening session with military spouses on the unique challenges they face in finding and maintaining employment to support their families. And yesterday, we hosted over 100 small businesses for a discussion on how they help to keep the American dream alive for millions of workers around the country. As I mentioned uh, last week, I want to take time to uh, recognize people from around the country that write in and ask the president questions. And today I wanted to read you a special letter to the president from someone who embodies the enterprising and ambitious spirit of America. Frank from Falls Church, Virginia wrote, Dear Mr. President, it would be my honor to mow the White House lawn for some weekend for you. Even though I'm only 10, I'd like to show the nation what young people like me are ready for. I admire your business background and have started my own business. I've been mowing my neighbor's lawns for some time. Please see the attached flyer. Here's a list of what I have and you can and you're free to pick whatever you want. Power mower, push mower and weed whacker. I can bring extra fuel for the power mower and charged batteries for the weed whacker and he'll do that with no charge. Sincerely, Frank. Frank, I'm happy to report back to you that I just spoke with the president. He wanted me to be sure and tell you to that you're doing a great job and keep working hard. He also asked me, we found out when we called uh, to let you know that we would be reading this letter to wish you a happy birthday. I think Frank went from 10 to 11 in the time that we received and were able to uh, respond to this letter. And he also wanted me to invite you to spend a morning here at the White House with the groundskeeper. The groundskeeper, we've talked to them and they'd love to show you how the U.S. Park Service maintains the 18 acres of the White House complex and he'd love to give you the opportunity to cut the grass in the Rose Garden. It's our responsibility to keep the American dream alive for kids like Frank, immigrants who are already here and those who dream of immigrating here in the future. And with that, I'll take your questions. Sarah, on, on Russia, Sarah, Sarah. Sarah. Justin. Um, does the president believe that white applicants to college are the victims of discrimination? I'm sorry? Does the president believe that white applicants to college are the victims of discrimination? Uh, I'm not aware of that opinion at all. I certainly haven't had that conversation or have any reason to. Then can you explain why the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division is devoting its limited time and resources to Quite that? an accusatory question, but I'd be happy to respond. Uh, the New York Times article is based entirely on uncorroborated inferences from a leaked internal personnel posting in violation of Department of Justice policy. And while the White House does not confirm or deny the existence of potential investigations, the Department of Justice will always review credible allegation of discrimination on the basis of any race. And I don't have anything further on that. Thank you. Why did the president say that he received a phone call from the leader of the Boy Scouts and the president of Mexico when he did not? Did he lie? No, in the on Mexico, he was referencing the conversation that they had had at the G20 summit where they specifically talked about the issues that he referenced uh, in terms of the Boy Scouts, uh, multiple members of the Boy Scout leadership uh, following his speech there that day, uh, congratulated him, praised him and offered uh, quite um, um, I'm looking for the word, <laughs> quite powerful uh, compliments uh, following his speech, and those were what those references were about. specifically said that he received a phone call from the president of Mexico. And they were actually the direct, they were direct conversations, not actual so phone calls. So he lied, he didn't receive I, I wouldn't say it was a lie, it was, uh, that's pretty uh, bold accusation. It's a, the, conversa the conversations took place, they just simply didn't take place over a phone call, that he had them in person. John. Uh, Sarah, if I could ask a couple of questions about Russia. Uh, Dmitry Medvedev, the uh, Prime Minister, has weighed in on the President's signing of the sanctions, saying that this proves that the Trump administration is, quote, utterly powerless and ends hopes for better ties. What's the White House response? Uh, look, this morning the President signed uh, the Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act. The President favors tough measures to punish and deter the bad behavior of the rogue regimes in Iran and North Korea. And he also sent a clear signal that we won't tolerate interference in our democratic process by Russia. 
The bill was improved, but Congress has encroached on the power of the presidency, and he signed it in the interest of national unity. Uh, we've been very clear that we support tough sanctions on all three of those countries. We continue to do so, uh, and that has certainly not changed, and I think that was reflected in the statements today. One, point, one of the finer aspects of the bill and the findings, uh, it, it stated that Russia did, in fact, try to interfere in the U.S. election. In the president's statement on the signing statement, he did not quibble with that? Is that an indication that he does accept the finding that Russia interfered in our election? The president's already said that himself. Uh, directly at the press conference in Poland, he may have been, may involved, have been involved, as involved as well, but he doesn't dispute the fact that Russia was, and he said that in Poland at the press conference that I believe you were present for. One more you said uh, on Monday that when you had something to say about the Russian action on 755 diplomats, uh, you would say something about it. Do you have anything to say about it today? No, I don't, but when I do, I'll let you know. Sarah, Sarah thank you. Did President Trump speak with speak with Russia's President Vladimir Putin prior to signing the bill or at all today? No. That's definitive. That's confirmed. Let me just ask you something about uh, North Korea. General McCaffrey said that I think at some point we are clearly going to take dramatic action short of war against North Korea. Can you respond to that? Do you think that's an accurate characterization? Can you tell us where the administration's thinking is right now when it comes to taking some type of military action against North Korea to stop its provocations? As I've said many times before, we're not going to broadcast our actions, and we're keeping all options on the table. Yeah. Jordan. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask you the question I was going to ask Stephen. Um, the, the president said in an economist interview in May, he was asked whether he supports cutting the number of immigrants who can come here legally. He said no. Uh, the, this bill today that he supports would cut the number of green cards issued by half. So when did the president have a change of heart on this issue? I'd have to see the specific reference, but I know that the president has talked uh, pretty frequently about merit-based immigration reform, uh, not just on the campaign trail, but he's been talking about this for years. And uh, I can't comment on a story I haven't seen specifically. Lead to the reduction of total green cards. So I, does he have a separate opinion about the number of green cards? That, that I changed. think Stephen spoke pretty extensively on that, and I don't have anything to add beyond that. John. Thanks a lot, Sarah. The president, in signing this sanctions bill today, issued a signing statement. And in that signing statement, he said that the bill is significantly flawed. He said that it, there are provisions in this bill that are clearly unconstitutional. Why would he sign this bill if he felt so strongly that this bill uh, it inhibits his ability to act as uh, the commander-in-chief and to carry out his duties as president. Uh, I think I spoke on this already, but primarily because the president favors tough measures to punish and deter the bad behavior of the rogue regimes in Iran and North Korea. And he also sent a clear signal that we won't tolerate in interference in our democratic process by Russia. Uh, I also said that he signed it in the interest of national unity. And again, in support of, uh, there's, there's no question that there isn't support for the principles of the bill. It's maybe just some of the process piece. Steve. Yeah, see, I'm, just, I'm sorry. sorry. Does he also send a signal in signing this particular legislation that if another bill comes before his desk that he also finds significantly flawed and clearly unconstitutional, that he'd sign that legislation as well? I'm not going to speak about a hypothetical bill that we don't know and doesn't exist and whether or not the president's going to sign it. Steve. Clear up some confusion. There were almost simultaneously two signing statements that went out. They had slightly different language. Did you intend? to send both out or was it's actually that one signing statement and one press statement so that's the difference uh, there one's more of a legal document that goes with the executive secretary and the other one's a press document so that's the difference uh, I wanted to bring up some unfinished business when you were named press secretary because there was so much focus on the other announcement that day you only had a chance to talk in, about the job in one question so I wanted to give you a chance to ask, answer two questions that all of your predecessors Face. The first one is, what is your overall approach to the job, especially in terms of balancing whether you're serving the president or serving the public? And secondly, do you see any circumstances where it's appropriate to lie from the podium? Uh, I'll, I'll take the second one first. Absolutely not. I don't think it's appropriate to lie from the podium or any other place. Uh, on the first question, I think that the, the balance, my job is to communicate uh, the president's agenda, the president's message, and answer your questions on that as best that I can, as honestly as I can, and as transparent as I can possibly be at any given moment. Francesca. 
Uh, following up on the question about the position, what exactly is Sean Spicer's role in this administration at this point, and how much longer do you expect him to stay on staff? And then something on the signing statement. Uh, as he said, um, I believe that was, gosh, a week or so ago. <laughs> The days all kind of run together now, but he was going to stay on in a transition process uh, through August, and so uh, nothing has changed. Because of Anthony Scaramucci leaving? No, nothing's changed okay, at this point. And then on the signing statement, one of the things that it said was that it could it would drive China, Russia, and North Korea much closer together, these sanctions. Can you elaborate on that? Because yesterday you suggested that China was both an ally and a partner. I don't have anything to comment beyond the signing statement Sarah. itself. Alexa. Sarah, can I just follow up with two questions on DHS? Should we expect that more in September when Congress comes back a nomination, or is that possible soon? And the second question is, lots of lawmakers, Republicans on the Hill, and the business community have been concerned that the president won't stay focused on tax reform, that this is something they really want him to talk about. And you've just introduced immigration, you've got health care still hanging. Is the president going to focus on all of those issues in the weeks ahead going into September, or does he really want to showcase just one or two things? As we've said many times before, we can walk and chew gum at the same time, and we can work on a multitude of issues at the same time. Uh, in terms of the DHS uh, appointment, I don't have any personnel announcements at this time. Sarah. John Gizzi. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. This morning, uh, New Orleans Mayor Mitch Landrieu, president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, took a shot at Tom Holman, uh, the head of the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Uh, on June the 28th, right from that podium, Mr. Holman said, and I quote, uh, most law enforcement officials in cities work with us, but many don't in the largest cities, and that's where criminal aliens and criminal gangs flourish. End of quote. Mayor Landrew this morning said he's wrong about that, that kind of rhetoric is not helpful, and he added that police officers keep the streets safe irrespective of immigration status and do so all the time. Your response to Mayor Landrieu and his charge against someone who is mentioned frequently to be the next Secretary of uh, Homeland Security. Look, I think uh, Tom has uh, served our country well. He's been Straight active in law enforcement, and I would certainly trust his political opinion. Views. So uh, take one last question. Who very confident, a lot of confidence in him and his ability, having been in a multitude of different positions within law enforcement and been able to see it uh, in a lot of different places, not just one location like the mayor. Uh, so I would certainly defer to Tom on this issue. Jim. So then you would uh, you trust him more than you would Mayor Landrew on that issue? <laughs> I think that's pretty safe to say, Jim. Jim. Yes, um, Jeff Lee, uh, in a political magazine article, said the president was. Uh, he suggested the president was a carnival barker and had eroded conservatism. Um, is the president still thinking of helping to fund a $10 million challenge against Senator Flake? And does he have any response to Senator Flake's uh, comments? Uh, I'm not sure about any potential uh, funding of a campaign, but I think that Senator Flake would serve his constituents much better if he was less focused on writing a book and attacking the president and passing legislation. Uh, Alex. Two American soldiers were killed today in Afghanistan. It's nine on the year. Uh, does President know about this and does he feel any sense of uh, urgency to um, implement a new plan <coughs> in the conflict there? Yeah, I can't comment on that at this time, but I'll certainly keep you posted. Sarah. Trey. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, did President Trump feel pressured into signing the Russia sanctions bill? No, as I've said, the president supports uh, putting pressure uh, on these three countries in particular, and so he supports the principle of it and wanted to take action in that course. Yeah. Steve? I just want to follow up. You were asked yesterday by Gary Rizzi whether uh, the president would weigh in on this question of cost sharing payments. Can you put this to bed? Will the administration continue making cost sharing payments or not? Uh, the CSR payments are uh, bailing out at this point a failed law that the president wants to repeal and replace. Since last year's campaign, the president has been clear that Obamacare is a failed law. He's working with his staff and his cabinet to consider the issues raised by the CSR payments. And without Congress fulfilling its promise to American voters in repealing and replacing Obamacare, insurers will continue to flee this failing system. We need real reform. That